from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 78, recorded on March 19th, 2024. Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to be here and to talk about immunology again. From Cleveland, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Hey, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Uh, off camera for a little bit, but don't worry. I'll be back on soon. Do you know that today is International Men's Day? I didn't know there was a thing. I, I did I not. I just, hope that you're having a good day. Are you having a no, good day, Vincent? I have a good day every day. I don't need a day. <laughs> I don't need a day to celebrate. No one has has said anything, which is fine. That's I just funny. Thought I would mention it, but I, I mean, just a week ago it was International Women's Day. Yes, right? it was. Yes. And I, was it last Thursday? Was International Kidney Day? Oh my gosh! There's wow. a day for everything. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Kidney day, okay. <laughs> and from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Um, it's great to see you all and talk about immunology, and I hope you're having a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Male, or female, female or otherwise. Kidney. Yeah, I, wonder if, <laughs> I guess it's Kidney Day because of transplants yes. and so forth. Yeah, sure. But I can't imagine that there's a day for every organ, right? I, mm. I mean, there's enough days. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> guess it depends on how good of an association you have who's lobbying to make yeah, these days right. happen. That's right. Because yeah. I think almost every... There's Should a there polio day. there be an international day? immune day or virus day? Or? There is a day of immunology. That's There is. You're yep. right. You're right. Good call. There's, there's a, a polio virus day. I know yep. that for sure. Okay. So today we have a little bit something different for you. We ha we're each going to do a little a paper... Uh, in uh, not as much time as we normally would, and so uh, you get a you get a kind of smorgasbord of immunology today, right? A smorgasbord is when you go to it's like a buffet; you can pick different things, right? <laughs> but we all picked it. You don't get to pick, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We all pick. So uh, four papers, and let's start with Cindy. All right. So I I could not resist talking about this paper. Got a lot of press. Um, the title of it doesn't quite do its service, but it's called The Adaptive Immune Responses Are Larger and Functionally Preserved in a Hypervaccinated Individual. So those of you who have been paying attention might realize which paper this is. It came out in Lancet, um, and it has a bunch of authors that I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your name, but the first author is Katharina Koker. And it is from several groups in Germany. And it is in Germany because it is about one is a case report basically about one individual <clears throat> who decided to continuously get immunized for COVID nineteen um, for a total at the point of this when they put the publication together two hundred and seventeen times. Wow! <laughs> so most of us have had. Between in, three and five. In 29 months. In 29 months, yes. So um, I got interviewed by a journalist who was asking me questions, and they, mm -hmm. they calculated this and gone through and counted. There was one month in which the individual got vaccinated 49 times. What? Wow. Wow. They're doing it's multiple than, daily. Per day. Like per multiple day. Multiple per day. Crazy. That's crazy. It but is he crazy. Fa he, he found someone who would do this. So I think he was skirting the system, which is how I got caught because uh, uh. whatever their system is over there, um, they they found him out and they started investigating him. And that, that's how this group found out about it. And they, they reached out and they said, hey, can we actually look at the immune response in this individual? Because it's not something that happens every day. No one is going to be vaccinated <laughs> 217 times. So anyway, so uh, the, the paper starts out with a very good point um, and that, that we do prime boost vaccinations because usually one dose is not sufficient unless it's a live attenuated vaccine. Some of those are good with one, and, but usually still even require a prime boost. However, chronic antigen exposures with cancers or chronic viral infections often lead to tolerance. So they were very curious mm -hmm. about this individual who had now been vaccinated up to two times per day <laughs> in certain months. <laughs> um, what was the immune response like? 
Yeah. And so one could predict like, wow, this is a really good idea. <laughs> you could get vaccinated every day and never get sick. Or perhaps this is actually a bad thing and we can learn something from this. Yeah. I remember um, a while ago we talked about the papers about uh, length of time that T-cells can live where right. they did transfer from mouse to mouse to mouse and had you know, yep. T-cells that were living and seeing antigen over 10 times or like, were many times longer than the life of a mouse. I don't remember. 10 years. Yeah, yeah. 10 years. Mm. Yep. Um, and I remember part of that was the spacing was super important, that Correct. it didn't work if it was too close together. And yep. I feel like multiple times in one day might be too close together. Well, we also talked on Immune with Gabriel Victoria, mm -hmm. and and he, he was – at a little bit, if I remember, concerned about the timing. Was it him or was it so – there was one other person we interviewed. The spacing of the vaccines for COVID-19 mm -hmm. in that, that three-week time period might not actually be optimal. Not, I think there's data on that now. Yeah, that a longer time period, maybe four weeks or six weeks, is actually optimal for having an um, uh, optimal immune response. I can't remember the timing. Nonetheless, this 62-year-old male individual – decided on his own to go and get immunized <laughs> this many times. So I, honestly, you, you might not blame him for the first few because he did get the J&J &J and, and we did find out that that was not the best vaccine to get, <laughs> that people needed to get boosted. But he has had pretty much everyone on the market. So <laughs> good. Uh, yeah. Really shopping around. So, you know, one of my initial thoughts was, man, like this man is not working. He's not what his life is consumed with, <laughs> with going finding standing in line to people vaccine. to get him yeah, vaccinated. But then I thought, I mean, if he's doing this for other people's vaccine cards, he's making money. And so that's maybe his economic incentive to do this. Never thought about that. It never I, crossed my, over. That's very I, interesting. I'll go get yeah. vaccinated and sign your car. I don't know. I, I would think that in Germany, their restrictions are pretty stiff about showing your own think. ID and things. Yeah, that's but true. Who knows? That's true. Who Maybe knows? I'm wrong. Um. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so uh, it's important to note that this was outside the, <laughs> the space of a clinical study or context. No one would ever recommend this. It is against the national vac uh, vaccine recommendations anywhere. Uh, so don't think that this is a great idea. Um, <laughs> it, and they, they, they do note that they're they were able to confirm 130 of the vaccinations, but the person self-reported the other ones. But they, they, so they were able to get his th this man's consent, and he volunteered to provide his medical information and donate his blood and saliva. So they were able to test this, and they intervened with him before his 214th vaccination mm -hmm. and did a bunch of analyses and, and recommend that he not go get immunized anymore, but he did anyway. And then they were able to analyze data after the other ones as well. But nonetheless, they, um, they compared uh, his data to um, normal people who had been vaccinated three times, like normal individuals. Um, and you know, long story short, he definitely had more antibodies to the spike protein. So remember that when we're immunized, we're immunized with a modified uh, version of the spike protein that is stabilized so that we can generate a good immune response against it. And it is the only antigen in that vaccine mixture. Now, there are um, other vaccines that he didn't get on the market now that are like killed vaccine and they would have all the antigen in it. But this one just had spike, the ones he had just had spike, <clears throat> which is important because at the end of the study, which I'll, I'll jump to that, is they tested, um, he got tested a number of times for infection and tested negative for PCR, negative for antigen testing, so the, the rapid test that we all do, um, and also went and got tested for um, T cells and antibodies, or I'm just sorry, just antibodies to the nucleocapsid protein, which he would only have if he had been infected. And there was no evidence of that. Now, right off the bat, this does not mean that getting vaccinated 217 times effectively keeps you from getting in infected, because it could be just that he has a natural stronger immunity after the first immunization. And so we can't really say this. Also, probably given. The fact that he went and got 200 vaccine, 217 vaccines is probably a little bit neurotic about getting exposed to COVID. So Yeah, he may have taken some extra precautions. <clears throat> maybe took some extra precautions that a normal individual might not do. 
So we can't make any conclusions of saying that, okay, had more antibodies, so that's why I didn't get infected. We're never going to make that conclusion. But um, he, they did find that he had specific B cells. He had specific T cells. He definitely had higher amounts of total antibodies and had higher amounts of neutralization capacity. However, they did go and say, well, is that because he has better, more high affinity antibodies? And that was not the case. So he just has more of them, mm -hmm. but not necessarily better mm -hmm. antibodies, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But it also tells us that having those immunizations didn't cause tolerance per se. So how he would still you know is able it, to respond. How would you know about tolerance? Like how would it manifest? So you might have uh, fewer, less antibody production because those B cells might be tolerized in producing less antibodies, you would also probably have T cells that are hypo-responsive, and they mm. were able to analyze T cell um, cytokine production at least, and they were certainly able to produce cytokine. In fact, he had more of a subtype of T cells called an effector T cell, an effector memory T cell, and they produced more cytokines. Yeah, so, so tolerance would be really <clears throat> specifically, I would think about fewer antigen-specific cells, um, and those cells making less cytokines. Right. Not as that if that's a spoiler for my paper at all or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that you th might think would happen would be the cells will become more and more and more clonal because as you stimulate, you're going to reactivate those clones that are already activated and have become memory cells. And they do show that, although it from the their highest control responder, it's not hugely different, but there is more clonality. Uh, and and so there are more there's more expansion of individual clones, but not necessarily more T cells or B cells that recognize the antigen per se. And they proliferate similarly, so it's not like they're less or more functional when they're looking at T cells, um, although they can produce more cytokine. Did you get all these shots in the same arm, do you know? <laughs> they did not say that, actually. Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I, the one thing that I thought that was kind of interesting is that it mentioned that he had... Um, he mentioned like no side effects. None, zero. Yeah. Yep. Right. That's and correct. That surprised me. Um, yeah. 217 times, sometimes multiple a day and no uh -huh. side effects. That's, yeah. That's wild. I, I mean, it doesn't speak to, you know, because we know there's a range of side effects. Correct. Some people have none. Some people, yep. it took them out uh, for a mm -hmm. day of feeling malaise and, and maybe feverish. So, but it is interesting that it, it's not a dose dependent effect, effect, at least in this individual. Nope. And he did have uh, both the uh, nanoparticle ones as well as the other adenoviral particle ones, various different ones. The one thing of note that I thought was pretty cool about this is they measured saliva antibody. And if you think about what would be the highest correlative protection from infection, it might be some mucosal antibodies. Now, there wasn't a big difference in um, the levels of IgM. There was a little tiny bit more of um, anti-spike IgM in the, in the saliva and the serum. But they did have, um, and there was, no, there was not really much difference in IgA, which is the antibody subtype that we usually think of associated with uh, mucosal surfaces. What he did have that was much higher in his saliva than in any other controls was IgG. Now, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that stuff, um, why an individual might have a lot more of IgG in their saliva or in their mucosal surfaces versus not really having much more IgM or IgA. Sure. So it's interesting. Let me, let me uh, hop back on camera here, see if it, hello. Okay. Hi. So, hi. So, I. It's interesting when we look at mucosal surfaces for IgG. It it does seem to correlate if you can 
boost your anti um, spike, in this case, specific IgG, it can leak or really probably FCR and mediated transfer into the mucosal sites. But what's interesting is what it's it's in the saliva only. They're not seeing the reciprocal Correct. In, in blood. So it's hard to then predict what might be the reason. We know that there can be uh, IgG, I-type switch, plasma cells secreting antibodies at mucosal sites, mm-hmm. but we mostly think of those being stimulated by a mucosal-based vaccine, mm-hmm. especially for IgA. So I don't know. I don't know if this is a timing issue. Sometimes when Perhaps. we we do have delays in when we see certain levels of antibodies pop up, and I'm speaking mostly to breast milk because that's what we're looking at a lot in our lab, mm-hmm. um, there can be different temporal changes. And maybe that's what's being reflected here is we're just not sampling. We're, we're seeing maybe uh, a change, a delayed or an early change, but it's intriguing. It's not what I would have expected. I will yeah, say that. I agree. Yeah. The only other thing of note that I saw in this paper was there was a little bit more IgG4, which has also come up in the mm. in the discussions about you know is mm. IgG four good is it associated with anything I don't know um, <laughs> and it it was just at the top end of what their controls were now the the last thing I will mention is the T cell responses I did say they had many more of these effector memory cells but they did have a reasonable number of the the more um, quiescent memory cells that can then expand. Um, during an infection. So they overall had more T cells, which is a good thing, but I don't know that getting vaccinated 217 times is worth having (laughs) some more T cells. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd love to know what the goal, right, of this individual was. I mean, are they, are they thinking, are they an immunologically educated person where they're thinking about, uh, the, the, they're trying to keep, maintain the levels of antibodies high because they want neutralization at, at the, you know, their surfaces. So for example, I saliva, but I, I don't know. I, would, I mean, if you were going to do something like that, it would be like once every three months or so, because well, the sure. data show you sure. that at about three months, antibody levels start to drop. So if you, I'm not recommending this, <laughs> Let's put it out there. I'm not making a medical rec- medical recommendation, but if that were the rationale, based if you knew the science and you were following the science, I would think it would be about once every three to six months. You're right, but not they, twice. So they're a day. probably not reading the literature. I would say probably <laughs> probably not. Um, but I mean, what it tells us, what I think is the takeaway message is you can definitely get lots of. Uh, boosters, and you will have more T cells, and you will have more B cells that are specific for the antigen, but they're not necessarily any better at what they do. Right. So there was more antibodies because there was more B cells, and there was more cytokine production, mostly due to the fact that there were more T cells. But on a per cell basis, there wasn't really much more antibody, and there really wasn't much more T cell effector function, despite those massive numbers of immunizations. The flip side of that is it didn't cause tolerance that we can tell. So that's also a good thing. Um, So I think we can, what we can take away from this is it didn't cause harm, but it isn't necessarily any better really than getting the standard vaccination protocol that's recommended. There there doesn't seem to be any great reason to do this. No. (laughs) Well, they say at the end, we do not endorse hypervaccination exactly. as a strategy to enhance adaptive immunity. <laughs> right. Right. So, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but did this individual, where, when did this end? You know, when did the reported last vaccination end? <laughs> so, um, so in they, no, November of 2023 okay. is the last data point, although this group had recommended this person not get vaccinated again um, after 213 or something, but they continued to get vaccinated again and they were able to collect multiple more samples after that. We don't know at this point whether that individual has gone and gotten additional vaccines after that point. Gone rogue. Well, you know, it's interesting because at some point there was an update 
with the boosters. Yes. And mm-hmm. so could you yep. see a, a difference or would that matter? But maybe he had recalled mm-hmm. so many of his you know, initial memory B cells to a point where they are just taking up the germinal center. There is no opportunity for yeah. uh, an, a de novo response to a new antigen. So he definitely got multiple. So he so he started with J&J, mm-hmm. did the AstraZeneca, and started sprinkling in some of the um, uh, Moderna's and, and Pfizer's. Pfizer's and then Moderna's. Like 2020... Three. End of 2022, oh, yep. he got one of the modified, and then in 2023, I guess I can't tell where this with the BA one if that's like January mm-hmm. or December. Uh, I'm just looking at the the red dots in Figure yep. One right. of right. when he said he got vaccinated, and so it looks like he got at least one of each of the modified vaccines. Right. Yeah. Like one of four different modified vaccines. Right. And what we but what we know from individuals who were just on the normal schedule, Mm -hmm. the modified with the new antigens did not significantly induce a de novo response. You have recall of your memory B cell responses from the original Wuhan. So I think this individual is seeing the same thing, maybe to even a greater extent because he's recalling his original memory cells. Uh, He's asking them to proliferate a lot more Mm -hmm. and, and, Probably no opportunity for that de novo response. And there's a lot of data with this because they did do some sequencing. They did single cell sequencing in SightSeq. So if you're interested in going and digging into some of those data, um, they are in there. And I think what I could take away, because they looked at, um, where is that in the supplement? They looked at some of the clonality and some of the, didn't they look at the sequences? Yeah, there's some affinity measurements. I thought they looked at the hypervariable region, but maybe they didn't get that detailed. They may not have gotten that detailed. So each time you get a memory response with each vaccination, is do we also have somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation and all that stuff every time or not? Do In we theory, know? yes. In theory. Ah. Yeah, because a memory B cell can be driven down a... a you know, plasma cell path, or it can also change mm. in the process. So is there any chance of getting um, uh, autoreactive antibodies? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the, we do have safeguards against that, though. Mm-hmm. So as, as your B cells go through um, somatic hypermutation, they're tested. Mm-hmm. And if they are too strongly reactive, they are eliminated. So we still have that safeguard to prevent those mm. autoimmune B cells from developing and then getting out into the periphery and causing a problem. Of course, there may be people that have defects in that process, right? Yep. Yep. For sure. You end up with autoantibodies. Okay. Sure, they can. Yep. But bottom line is huh. get more T cells and more B cells, but they aren't any better. Hmm. So stick to the normal schedule. I, I would, would I would be. love for a <laughs> psychosocial study on this individual because I just I want to know like all about his life. What is he doing? What is he thinking? I, so he represents to me the extreme, right? You have yes. one extreme: people yes. don't yeah. want any vaccines, and then this guy wanted endless vaccines. So yeah, the, human, and I just, the human condition is just remarkable. yeah, it's fascinating, right? I just wonder if this was paired with a intense fear of the virus. Was that what was driving it? You know, was this yeah. Yeah, right. I, right. It just would be interesting. But they did not comment, which is very interesting, on any other vaccinations. So we don't know whether he's up to date with any of the other vaccinations right, or right. also tried to get additional boosters for anything else. Sure. Like, for example, measles yeah. is, is reemerging as mm-hmm. a problem with outbreaks in a number of different places. Sure. Is he now trying to go get the measles vaccine? Right, right. Was this a SARS CoV? Cope to specific would, obsession uh, or yeah i would yeah. recommend a psychiatrist at this point <laughs> possibly. possibly right i feel the need to get vaccinated hundreds of times against everything can you help me well let's talk about this lie down <laughs> yeah <laughs> one of the things though is that you have to worry about pro-vaccination people using this as a reason that vaccines are safe and we have to be careful of that too right for sure because 
as you mentioned, Steph, different people have different reactions and one person might have a significant reaction to a vaccine and another person yeah. might not feel anything. And so just because this person got 217 of the vaccines doesn't mean that another individual might not have an adverse reaction. So it's, sure. it's not, it's not mm. translatable that way. So we have to be really careful. Right. Right. All right. That's yeah. great. Nice Thank snippet. You. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. <laughs> Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have a paper uh, actually first showed up uh, on my radar because a TWIV listener mentioned it. Um, and I thought that the question and the problem that these authors were solving or were addressing was sort of a really, it's a, que it's a question that I think people don't think about or we don't talk about in immunology um, and how hard of a problem this is as much. So this is a paper from Nature Biomedical Engineering. Um, it's called Synthetically Glycosylated Antigens for the Antigen-Specific Suppression of Established Immune Responses. Um, most of these um, individuals are from um, University of Chicago. Um, there are two co-first authors, Andrew Tremaine and Rachel Wallace. Um, and there are also some other um, folks from Paris, um, from a company um, in Cambridge, uh, from Johns Hopkins. Um, so we've got kind of a, a breadth of individuals and they are studying, like I said, kind of an interesting problem of immune tolerance. Um, so it was interesting that we already mentioned uh, issues of immune tolerance. Um, and I think that this gets at a common thing that immunologists um, should think about, which is that we often try to model things in um mouse models that may not be exactly similar to what we see in a clinical situation. So a lot of times when we might work on how do we induce tolerance, how do we stop a pathogenic immune response in um, someone with those autoimmune diseases we mentioned a, a bit ago, um, we try to do that maybe by preventing the autoimmune response or by acting against that response kind of early on. And in a patient, um, we're generally not going to catch them on the day that their autoimmune T-cell um, starts to cause problems. Um, generally, patients are going to be diagnosed sort of later in the process when they have a really established um, antigen-specific response that may have already caused some damage. Those cells are well and truly differentiated to effector or a memory phenotypes. Um, and so it's a hard problem to actually stop that immune response that's gone down the tracks a long way. Um, and so that's one of the things that they're working on in this paper is trying to actually establish tolerance when an immune response is already ongoing when the cells actually have already gone to being an effector or a memory cell. Um, and we really don't have a great way to do that. Um, we also don't often have a great way to suppress specific immune responses um, clinically. So if a patient has an autoimmune disease, we very often will treat them with very broad-based immunosuppression. Um, and so, and you know, earlier we use things like and we still use things like prednisone or cyclosporin and really are generally blocking innate immune responses or generally blocking T-cell responses. Um, more recently, we've been using antibodies against particular cytokines like TNF-alpha blockade. And that's been revolutionary for patients, but it's still a pretty broad immunosuppression. Like we're not suppressing all T-cells, we're just reducing one cytokine. Um, but you can think about those commercials and how many side effects and contraindications and things they have because you're doing a lifelong immunosuppression pretty broadly for your patients. And so the questions that these authors were really thinking about is, is there a way to get some antigen-specific tolerance so we could just try to suppress the um, T cells that are responding to the antigen of interest? And is there a way to work on this when the response is already established, mm -hmm. like you might see in a patient instead of thinking about this kind of early in a response, which is an easier problem to potentially solve for us immunologically. Um, so I thought that both of those uh, kind of questions made this an interesting study to look at. Um, and 
these authors had previously shown that by um, putting a um, glycosylation on their antigen, so specifically they were adding a glycosylation N-acetylgalactosamine um, conjugated to the antigen via a self-immolative linker, um, which allows the antigen to dissociate upon endocytosis. Um, they talk about their previous work showing that this could um, direct the antigen perhaps to tolerogenic antigen presenting cells. Hmm. Um, hmm. And they don't talk a ton about that. They just kind of cite the idea that they've thought about ha using this glycosylation as a modification on antigen before. And they have some past evidence of it potentially leading to tolerance. Here, they're really trying to use it to influence established immune responses and to influence um, antigen-specific responses. So when I think about um, inducing tolerance, you think about allergy shots or mm -hmm. um, subliguinal antigen exposure to induce tolerance. Can you talk a little bit about how this is different? You, I, th I think you said it's trying to target it directly to a subset of antigen presenting yeah, cells. Yeah, so they specifically tell us that this strategy, which they've used previously, will direct the antigen to APC networks, potentially in the liver. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of their past work, they talk a lot about getting to liver APCs with the idea of inducing kind of a tolerogenic response. Um, and so I thought that that was one, trying to understand that APC piece of this is, I think, one thing that they haven't fleshed mm -hmm. out as well in mm -hmm. this paper. Um, and I think that that's something to that I would certainly want to know more of, about mechanistically um, going forward. So compared to just allergy shots where it's pretty much any antigen presenting cell that might come in contact with that antigen. Right. Absolutely. And the hope is that it's going to generate a tolerogenic response because there's there's no like uh, danger with it. <laughs> right. Or there's no danger or potentially even that there is some kind of regulatory cytokine or regulatory environment. So it's not just no danger. It's actually actively uh, turning off our response. Because the one other mechanism that I know of that the allergy shots work through is to try and change at least, and, and it's not an autoimmune related one, but when you have uh, like ragweed allergy or peanut allergy, when you do allergy shots, some of the way it works is to cause a, an ice type class switch to IgG mm -hmm. so that then that IgG will bind the antigen and it's no longer going to bind IgE on mast cells and cause the allergic response. This mm -hmm. is a little bit different from that. Yeah, it is. Most of, so they do look a little bit at antibodies here, but the majority of what they are looking at is actually T-cell responses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and t cytokine production by T-cells or number of T-cells responding to the particular antigen. Um, and so it's this is much more T-cell focused, though they do in a couple of supplementary figures mention some of those things about um, whether they're making different amounts of antibodies to serve as an antigen sink. The, the T-cell response is really what's key here. Um, in what they're talking about. Um, so the first thing that they do is they actually um, take some cells from transgenic mice um, that have known um, receptors for an antigen called ovalbumin. So they mm -hmm. use either some cells that are called OT1 cells, um, which are from a mouse who has 100% of its T cells making um, CD8 T, T cells to this antigen ovalbumin. Or they use OT2 cells, um, and they those are 100% of that mouse's cells have CD4 cells responding to ovalbumin. Um, and they um, will actually take um, those cells and put them into a mouse and then give the mouse um, a vaccine or a, an immunization that includes this ovalbumin antigen. So we're not looking at a self-antigen at this point. We're looking at this foreign antigen, ovalbumin, um, that is complexed in um, figure one with um, an adjuvant called CFA and figure two, an adjuvant called R848. I'm not going to say a ton about the difference between what they're trying to do with those two uh, adjuvants. Um, but the idea is that they want their mice to have a lot of these potentially reactive cells 
And they want to then stimulate that large amount of cells that they've put into the mouse. Um, and so the idea is these mice should have an active um, CD8 and CD4 T cell response to ovalbumin. Um, they then provide ovalbumin treatments with this glycosylated version of ovalbumin that they've talked that I mentioned that is supposed to um, interact with uh, antigen presenting cells in the liver. They give um, three treatments with this glycosylated antigen um, at days 28, um, 35, and 42 after the exposure. And so these mice should have had a strong effector or memory response ongoing. And what they're trying to do is see if giving these later um, inductions of antigen will reduce the anti-OVA response. Um, and they do the controls of like OVA alone or OVA and the P, the, the um, glycosylation not linked or things like that. They do a lot of those kind of controls. Um, and they see that when they use their glycosylated antigen, they have a decrease in the number of the T cells. So it looks as though they've actually lost some of the T cells. Some of those T cells may have died by deletion. Um, and they also have um, decreases in the cytokine production by T cells. And so it looks as though the T cells are not as active, particularly in terms of their interferon gamma production, compared to T cells um, from mice that didn't get this treatment. Do they know where it's glycosylated? Is it in the epitope that's presented on MHC class two? How do how do they think this is actually working? Um, so they actually uh, do not talk about that mm. um, in terms of where it is specifically gly glycosylated, but they are using full ova mm -hmm. that is glycosylated. They do in some other experiments use just synfecal, mm. um, and it, they that's in some of their supplementary uh, data. Um, but most of the main part of the paper is actually using full ova with this glycosylation. So it's probably more the cells that are taking it up or how it's processed rather than the peptide. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that that's, was my understanding. And I, I, like you, would love to know more about some of those specific details um, that they, they don't really give us here. Fair enough. Um, and they see, they see this reduction, particularly with CD8 T cells, um, a little bit less with the CD4 T cells. They also see that some of their CD8 T cells seem to have some higher markers of um, exhaustion or um, sort of a, a little bit of a shift towards making FOXP3 um, and PD1 in some of their CD4 T cells. But I would say, um, particularly when you look at some of these data, um, there's an effect, but it is modest. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would, you know, run screaming about any of these <laughs> p-values or sizes of effects. But this is a hard problem and is not a yeah. problem that we as immunologists are often addressing. No. Um, and I would say that I think that the things like the timing um, after um, making effector cells and things like that might be really important here. And they don't do a ton of varying that. Um, and they also, like I said, do this again using um, R848 as their adjuvant instead of CFA. Um, they do the timing slightly different here, differently here, and their idea is that this is about looking at pre-existing effector cells versus pre-existing memory cells. Um, I don't know that they totally proved that to me super well. And I would say that, again, it's a modest effect. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also never heard of someone trying to really do this in this way before. Um, and it's a hard problem. So I, I sort of find that uh, interesting. They um, do another um, experiment that they don't, um, they, they also look at gene expression in these cells. Um, and so these uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells that have been exposed to glycosylated antigen do show some changes in um, expression of proteins that are associated with um, exhaustion and other types of sort of things that might make you think these are cells that are tolerized. Um, and they then say, okay, maybe something's weird about our study because we used OT1 and OT2 cells, which are cells that came out of a mouse. 
that mm. are transgenic and are so you know we made this mouse that has a hundred percent of its T cells that respond to to ova and a hundred percent of its CD4 cells, um, and then we transferred them. Maybe these cells are weird. Um, the good thing about having done that experiment is you can get a lot of those cells and really track their responses, but maybe they're weird. So they do the experiment again, now looking at endogenous ovalbumin specific cells in a mouse. Um, so instead of using transferred cells, now they're going to use the actual ovalbumin specific cells in a mouse itself, not with these previously transferred cells. Um, but again, it's the same kind of thing. They're using um, ovalbumin and CFA. Um, they're using this glycosylated antigen treatment. And again, they see kind of a modest effect, I would say. Um, they also do some depletion of PD-1 and show that some of this is happening through PD-1. Um, so all of this kind of makes sense and is interesting. Um, but the real issue or the real question you might think about is, okay, none of these are actually pathogenic T-cells. None of these T-cells were autoimmune T-cells in these mice. Um, and the effect is, as I've mentioned, kind of modest. So is it enough to actually make a difference in disease? Hmm. And you, we can think about all of those other treatments I told you about that are broadly immunosuppressive and how much a patient is immunosuppressed and is that enough immunosuppression to influence disease. Some of them you know, have really revolutionized things for patients. So they then take this forward and actually look at some disease models and see if they can ameliorate disease um, with this process. And they first, uh, they do two disease models of um, EAE, which is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. Um, they do one where they are basically vaccinating um, cells or like vaccinating mice and then transferring in um, effector cells into other mice um, that can lead towards pretty severe EAE or experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis disease in the mice, as well as um, so paralysis and other kind of disease states in these mice. And so they, they do this transfer um, and then they, after they transferred these cells, so basically they give the mice EIE and then they try to give them some doses of the glycosylated antigen. Hmm. Um, they play around with timing a little bit and it does look like timing matters quite a bit. But when they sort of get to their timing and right now um, I'm looking at figures like 5, C and D, mm -hmm. um, they show that the mice basically don't have disease when they've been treated with this glycosylated antigen compared to um, the mice that were treated with vehicle or with antigen that didn't have glycosylation or with other um, things. And it's a pretty big difference. Um, and if I were a mouse, um, I would be pretty excited about this <laughs> level of uh, treatment that might happen for EAE. So even though some of the, the T cell effects, like I said, were kind of modest effects, this looks like it has a pretty big impact on um, looking at organisms themselves. And they, they, again, play with the timing in terms of how late after the establishment of disease they can give this antigen. And they do see that even, you know, a couple weeks later, um, they are able to see amelioration of the disease. Um, and so I think that that's a pretty interesting and promising uh, idea in terms of something that we might want to kind of look at moving forward. Um, their CD4 cells in these mice are making far less um, cytokine. And so it does look like they are really helping the pathology of these mice. Um, they also look at another version of relapsing remitting uh, multiple sclerosis, and they can again see that their glycosylated antigen can decrease the pathology in the mice. Um, so this is, again, a model that sort of has some similarities to what you might see in human MS, where people are showing up with some pathology, then improving, then having pathology and improving. And it looks as though they can get a measurable response in their mice. Um, and then the final thing they do is they say, well, what if this is um, just a mouse thing? Um, and so they decide they want to look in non-human primates and see if they can make it work in non-human primates as well. 
um, but they don't have a good autoimmune model in mm -hmm. non-human primates. So they look to see whether they can actually suppress a vaccine-mediated response. Um, so they look at non-human primates that were vaccinated uh, with an SIV vaccine. Um, they then deliver uh, the glycosylated antigen um, to the non-human primates, and they're able to reduce the uh, T cell response that had mm -hmm. been previously elicited, elicited by the vaccine um, by about 50% at many time points. Um, and so again, it looks like it's working um, broadly in not just mice, but perhaps in uh, primates. And in the primates, they seem to see that FOXP3 seems to be um, more dramatically impacted than it was in the mice. Hmm. So thinking about other states where glycosylation changes, I, I often think about cancer. And I wonder, you know, cancers are somewhat resistant to the immune system. That's how they survive. And I wonder if changes in uh, tumor-specific antigens as far as their glycosylation state or anything might have something to do with this. I don't I, I have no I idea. I don't know, and they don't really mention that, but that's a really fascinating idea. I definitely think that that's something to to be thinking about. Um, I I really like... Again, the fact that they are trying to look at this difficult yeah. problem of yeah. dealing with pre-existing responses instead of prophylactically dealing with responses mm -hmm. is not something I see very often. Um, and I think the the concept here um, is an interesting concept that I would love to know more about what's going on with those that APC targeting. And I would love to yeah. know more about how playing with timing and thing can things can impact this because I could imagine ways that this could really improve a lot of patients' lives. Um, they've mentioned that they do have the idea of making some of these glycosylated antibodies in clinic or glycosylated antigens, excuse me, in clinical trials. Um, and I think that that's a, a cool idea. And maybe, you know, some day down the road, I could imagine this helping some people out. I wonder if it could help those uh, autoantibodies generated by EBV which cause MS, you know? In Potentially, yeah. Yeah. And so do you think, you know, you had mentioned that the severity of the disease mattered in this paper, right? Whether mm -hmm. they're using a t, a t cells with a disease phenotype or the EAE model. So do you see that being similar in humans where the effectiveness of the treatment is going to be dependent? And they're only looking at, you know, a couple disease phenotypes here. So what are your thoughts on the translatability? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that that, I like that they talk about that because I think that sometimes we say, oh, you have to have a this massive reduction in number of T cells, but we don't necessarily know what is the number of T That's cells true. that need to change mm -hmm. to make to be biologically relevant right, in right. the disease state. Um, and so, you know, I don't, you know, like I said, I wouldn't go home, run home and like shout about the statistics in some of their earlier sure, um, sure. T cell papers, but it does look like that that's measurable, at least in the mouse. And I know that some of the um, other sort of broadly immunosuppressive responses are not necessarily 100% immunosuppressing in other cases. And so maybe sort of that partial response to just stop the, the cycle um, is enough. That's a good point. Really, a reduction of harm is probably what these patients are looking for, not a complete mm -hmm. amelioration of the disease. So yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. Thank you, Brianne. Okay, Steph, you're next. Sure. So the, the snippet I have today is a paper in Science Immunology, and it's by Catherine Sanadad as the first author and Melody Zhang as the senior author, who is at Cornell, Wow Cornell in New York City. Yep. And the title is Gut Bacteria-Derived Serotonin Promotes Immune Tolerance in Early Life. Uh, recently came out. And I think it's just a really fascinating paper because it first starts with this observation they had where in their neonatal mouse pups compared to adult mice, they had much greater levels of neurotransmitters in their small intestines. And to the point, uh, to the fact where the adults were almost zero and, and, and the, um, the infants, the neonates were I'm looking at four stars here for some of them, three stars, two stars. So highly significantly increased. And these are things like 
hypotaurine, acetylcholine, trimethylamine N-oxide, N-acetylglucosamine, and N-hydroxybutyrate. So that was, it seemingly was their first observation that the neonates have higher levels of this in their small intestines, and then they want to ask why and what are the implications. And so one of the first things they do is they look at these levels in either germ-free or SPF mice. And so for, uh, for the uninitiated, germ-free means they have no microbes, and SPF mice means they have microbes, but they are tested regularly for pathogenic microbes. And so specific pathogen-free is what the SPF stands for. And they see a significant reduction in these neuro, in, in neurotransmitters in the germ-free mice, and particularly they, they um, focus on serotonin at levels that significantly drop in germ-free mice. And they go on to talk about how serotonin is made, and so tryptophan is converted into serotonin by um, an enzyme called TPH1. And then you could degrade Trypto, uh, serotonin by, now I'm going to have to find my highlighted portion, MAO, monoamine oxidase A. And so they are looking for things that are, uh, that are taking uh, tryptophan and converting it into serotonin, which is significantly enriched in the neonatal intestine, which goes away when you take away the microbes. And so what that suggested to them was that it's a microbe dependent function. And so they go on a hunt to try to identify what are the microbes that are inducing this level of, of serotonin. And they look at THP1 upregulating bacteria or MAOA, which is the serotonin degrader, uh, that, that upregulate that gene that degrades it. And they show you, of the, they have like 30 some different isolates and either the THP one's upregulated or the MAOA is downregulated. And they pull out bacteria, one isolate, that, there was a bunch that upregulated uh, the, the converting enzyme to serotonin, the THP one upregulators, but they selected one. And then they selected one isolate that was upregulating the um, enzyme that degrades serotonin so that they could monocolonize these mice with these bacterial isolates to prove that they were driving the phenotypes that they were seeing or that the bacteria are responsible for the differences in the serotonin levels. And they do show that to be true, that one of the bacteria that had upregulation of THP1, you put it in a mouse and they have higher levels of serotonin and you put the, and I, I think it was called rodentium haley, I, I pronouncing Haley Haley Hale. and then yeah. E. Feca uh, e. Enterococcus. Enterococcus faecalis was, was, now it still seemed to upregulate it if you look at yeah. figures J and K, but less, less so yeah. than the ISO that was meant to upregulate serotonin. So what they're suggesting is that serotonin biosynthesis in the neonatal intestine, the small intestine, is driven by gut microbes, and they've chosen two to show a different phenotype in their mouse pups. And so then they uh, want to kind of further ask, um, what are the producers of serotonin in, in the gut? So in the adults, there is still some production of serotonin, but we mentioned it's less. Um, and in the adults, it, or in the past adult intestine literature, it was enterochromaffin cells, or ECs, that were the major producers of serotonin in the adult intestine. And so they went through the trouble of creating uh, a model to knock out um, THP1 deficient animals, and that suggested that it was not the interchromaffin cells that were the major producers in the neonatal intestine, whereas that wasn't true for the adult intestine. So the difference suggested that there was something else in the neonatal intestine that was driving serotonin production. They also looked at, wanted to look at mast cells, um, and here they, I at least I don't think they used a, knock, an, um, a mouse model that was knocked out with mast cells. I think they just counted them and saw that they were similar 
between SPF and germ-free animals. So I, they said that that was enough for them to suggest that it wasn't mast cells because they were not different. I think you would want to create the mouse knockout, right? You would want to knock that out to potentially prove that. I mean, um, there are mast cell deficient mice. I mean, that's been done for a long time that you can take m mast cells from one mm -hmm. ma mice and put them in to these mast cell deficient mice. So they could have taken knockout mast cells and put them into the wild types to reconstitute them and see if there's a phenotype. But Sure. Because I think the number, sure, they were the same, but what if they the production was of yeah. serotonin was higher or lower, even though the numbers were the same. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but that's, um, so they then, uh, took, so they, they didn't, they saw that it wasn't either of those two cells and that it then, okay, could have been the bacteria. And, and again, they, that's when they, they went through the different bacteria isolates to see which ones are up and down regulated. They did this also with human infant stool samples because what I noticed a lot of the names of these bacteria that were potentially contributing to the higher levels of serotonin in the neonatal gut were names like uh, rodentibacter. And so to me, that's a rodent specific bacteria. Hmm. And so then the question is, can human infants also, you know, can their bacteria produce serotonin? Um, and they, they took stool specimens and they found that they too could produce it. Um, they were different though. They were Staph aureus, Clostridium, Klebsiella, um, Staphylococcus, Epidermis, and Arabacter. So uh, they were different types of bacteria, but they still found in humans that the levels from the stool of the neonates in humans, those levels of serotonin were higher than those found in the adult human stool sample. So um, that was some additional evidence to suggest that the neonates are unique in their ability to produce this, uh, to produce serotonin. So they wanted to ask next what the serotonin's role was, and they looked to T cell responses, mm. and they, they found that in the neonatal intestines that the T regulatory cells were decreased in mm. the germ-free mice, and particularly they, they did also um, some organoid work and found that treating them with serotonin changed the um, uh, I'm sorry, in the mice that were treated with serotonin, that the levels of the Tregs were different in the small intestine, uh, as well as some other cell types. And so they then used that as rationale to say, well, what do T regulatory cells do? Well, they are meant to uh, promote tolerance in the gut. So if neonates have higher levels of these neurotransmitters of serotonin, produced by bacteria that's unique to the neonate that's driving a Treg development. They're mm -hmm. showing both in vitro and in vivo. Maybe the reason they're doing that is so that the neonates can promote tolerance to different things in their environment. And so they mm -hmm. go on to a series of experiments where they are inducing, so the oral tolerance model uh, which is the oral gavaging with oval albumin. Um, and they, but what they first is they orally gavage the germ-free neonates with either serotonin or PBS, um, sensitize them, and then challenge them at five weeks of age and re-challenge them at seven weeks of age to drive the phenotype, which would be a, uh, an immune response against oval albumin. And they found that serotonin-treated mice had lower plasma levels of the anti-OVA IgG and IgE, little bit IgM, but also decrease in spleen interferon gamma and IL-4-producing CD4 T cells. They also looked at macrophages and neutrophils. So broadly, we're suggesting that those animals were responding, that were treated with serotonin, were responding to a lesser degree to ovalbumin, which means greater tolerance. Which might make evolutionary sense because probably, you know, when you're relatively young as a neonate, you're getting colonized 
for the first time by certain members of your microbiome. And it would be bad if you started to make responses to all of them immediately. And so perhaps you need to have kind of a time where you're getting some tolerance to some of those early microbiome members. Definitely. So that, that they took your suggestion and that was the next part of their paper where they, they, so they looked at dietary antigens first, mm -hmm. but then they wanted yeah. to see if the response to gut commensal bacteria was changed. And so they took, okay, germ-free mice and they gavaged them with the small intestine and colon luminal contents of SPF wild type mice to allow colonization in their guts. And then they transferred these bacteria to PBS or serotonin treated litter mates. Because the thing about these experiments is you need litter mate controls. You mm -hmm. can't house them separately because then you might have an effect of the cage microbiome. I think one of the big mm -hmm. things we've learned in the past, I don't know, Cindy, if you have a historical perspective, but there was definitely a change in oh, yeah. the mm -hmm. standards of which we do microbiome research. You can't house one treatment group alone from your control because they're going to have different microbes and that, that could be the driver of the response. Correct. So um, housing, having these housed together and doing these transfer experiments was how they accomplished that goal. Um, and they found that the serotonin treated litter mates had a higher abundance of Tregs, lower abundance of Th17 cells, which we know um, Tregs promote tolerance. Th17 can drive disease. Um, and it seemed to be dependent on serotonin treatment in the neonatal mice. Uh, so that, I think they did some other things, but I think that they did, oh, they, one more thing I wanted to mention was that they wanted to know if early colonization, I'm sorry, if the serotonin impacts on microbial colonization imprinted the gut T cells hmm. to do something special if you were to take them out of that context. So they hmm. adoptively transferred them into RAG2 mice, which don't have their own T cells, and found that the animals with T cells who were in a host that was treated with serotonin, um, they fared better. They had reduction in IL-17 positive CD4 T cells, for example, showing that those T cells were more tolerogenic innately. It wasn't their environment because you took them out of their environment and they still performed better. So yeah, I, I liked the paper because it identified something biologically different about mm -hmm. neonates and then proved to us that it matters in multiple different ways. So like Did they it. talk at all about, so one of the ways in which Tregs function is using tryptophan as a substrate to make uh, downstream tolerogenic things. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, indolamine dioxygenase, IDO, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, by uses the tryptophan. kynurene path yeah, pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and pathway. I wonder if the, the enzyme that you're talking about, TPH1, trans it it tr turns tryptophan into serotonin so i wonder if you make more serotonin or you give more serotonin then that enzyme isn't changing as much tryptophan into serotonin so there's more tryptophan around and tryptophan is is, is an essential amino mm -hmm. acid and so it is rate limiting Right. for the regulatory T cells. So I I wonder just if that plays any role in that. So if you put more of the product in, then more of the substrate can accumulate and then that can then be used for something else with the the tolerogenic T cells. I don't know if they thought about or did anything Yeah, they to brought that, that up cuz they did do a, some metabolomics work mm -hmm. and the a seahorse assay to look at oxygen consumption. Um, but I don't remember, I don't think they specifically addressed that in the T cell experiments. Okay. Like they, it would have been beneficial maybe to adoptively transfer, like do some of those T cell transfer experiments in environments with either more or less tryptophan, which yeah. is what you're suggesting. Yeah. Right? Right. If it's in abundance, does that innately affect the T regs? Yeah. Okay. I guess it's all interconnected, right? Because presence of the, the product is probably going to regulate the abundance of the enzyme that mm -hmm. makes yep. the reaction. So it's all 
yeah, there's feedback loops and things. Right, right. But I just think it's so cool that it's the, you know, the bacteria are regulating this whole process. Mm. <laughs> there's so just more, sure. more examples of bacterial produced mm. things that modulate things all over our body. Right. And as you're growing up, you need to get the right bacteria in those first months Correct. of life, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right, because they tried to induce this phenotype derived from the bacteria in the adults, and it didn't work. And mm. so it suggests yeah. that if you're already colonized, it would be difficult. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Steph. Sure. Yep. Cool. All right, one more. This one um, suggested by Anne, a listener. Science immunology, mucosal and systemic immune correlates of viral control after SARS-CoV-2 infection challenge in seronegative ad adults. So first author is Helen Wagstaff, and uh, the last author is Christopher Chu. And um, this is a study that was done a while ago in the UK. It was a controversial human challenge study with SARS-CoV-2. I actually... One of the, the the second to last author, Peter Alpenshaw, I, I sat next to him <laughs> at a meeting last year. Uh, <laughs> he talked about this. He's very gung ho, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like I remember um, sometimes discussing this study on Twiv and we not did. always being very gung ho. <laughs> <laughs> we um yeah we discussed the original paper where they did the challenge and this is a follow up where they're mm -hmm. looking at uh, immune correlates both systemic and, and mucosal very interesting so I mean the, the point here is that it, no matter what observational study you do you can't control everything mm -hmm. so if you want to know how long viruses shed where it's shed uh, how that correlates with symptoms it's very hard to do because. A lot of people have asymptomatic infections, so you can't study them. Anyway, so they challenged humans. Mm. 34 healthy adult volunteers, 18 to 29 years old, they got 10 to the 5th PFU, dripped right into their nose. About half of them got infected. And so uh, they measured uh, soluble mediators like cytokines. We'll talk about and antibody levels in the nasal fluid. And in the plasma daily, T and B cell responses in the in the peripheral blood, uh, and interestingly, they they treated six participants with remdesivir and found that that didn't have any effect on viral load or mm -hmm. symptoms. So they decided to throw those data in <laughs> with these as well. All right. So what what they find is um, so VL is viral load. So they're measuring viral load by by PCR. And um, what's first interesting is that the nose and the throat are different. It's very, right? very interesting, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I could have told you. My nose looks different from my throat, but you know, they had I, to find out. I, I, I always talk about those important things like the lungs are <laughs> important organs and the lungs, lungs are and the, important, the yes. nose are in fact different. Yes. <laughs> so they found... Um, Earlier detection of viral replication in the throat compared with the nose, which which is really counterintuitive, right? Because yeah. you inhale, and you stuck it in the nose. <laughs> you suck it in the nose for sure, and yet apparently when you do that, it also goes into your throat, which yeah. makes sense. And yeah. it's it you detect it earlier there, and you also get but you get earlier viral clearance in the nose. Mm. So they well, say isn't, these. Isn't that why there was a whole controversy. I don't know if it was controversy, but it was like, should we be throat swabbing? Yes. Because people were popping up positive yep. by yeah, throat yeah. swabbing, mm -hmm. but not nasal swabbing. But it's like, yep. no, that they weren't tested for that, but that's biologically yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I was very sick last week um, and was no, <laughs> nose swabbing. And there were a couple of times where I was like, hmm, should I be throat swabbing? Throat swabbing. <laughs> Would I get a different answer? So if you want to know the days we're talking about here. So the throat, the, you, you first detect viral replication, 1.78 days mm. and 2.61 days in the nose, you know, about a day later. And the clearance uh, is, um, we're talking about uh, throat 3.4 days versus the nose 5.1 days. 
So how yeah. frequently are they swabbing these people? Multiple Every times day. per day or once per day? <laughs> no, they're not getting vaccinated multiple times a day. <laughs> no, no, they, swab, they, they get swabbed. swabbed. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm joking. The other <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like... Measured daily. So they huh. swab them daily, yeah. So how do you, is it just um, a mathematical calculation? Because how do you have somebody turn, it's average, right? Yeah, it's a math. It's actually a, um, it's a modeling. a modeling. They take the data and okay. they put it into models okay. because otherwise the data are all over the place because everybody's so different. Right? Yeah, because I'm looking at the overlays yeah. of everything and I was wondering yeah. how they got those curves. Okay. So basically they say the, the nose and the throat are independently regulated, which is mm -hmm. good to know, right? All right, then they look for cytokines and chemokines. They do a multiplex panel looking in both the the, nano, the nose swabs and the plasma. And they see, as you might expect, uh, increases in a variety of chemokines and cytokines. Uh, a, a bunch of them peak six to ten days after inoculation. So it takes mm -hmm. up to six days for them to peak. They start earlier. You know, you can you can see them earlier, but they peak. At, uh, at that time. Then they go back down. Some of them remain for 14 days. Some of them remain for 28 days. Um, and uh, the, if you compare the nose and the plasma, um, some of them get activated at more or less the same time. Um, uh, and some of them are different. Some of them differ in the plasma in the blood. In fact, one of the conclusions they make is that our results challenge the assumption that the circulating immune response is unidirectionally driven by or a simple reflection of inflammation at the site of infection. Huh. So that's, which is the way I always thought, right? But it's not always true, according to this. Um, interferon responses dominate at the site of virus entry. And, and they say the, the, re the responses are compartmentalized. But here's the thing. Uh, in the previous study of this challenge, there was no correlation between the magnitude of viral load and symptom severity. Yes. But here they see the symptom correlates with these systemic mediator responses. Which Not the local sense. ones, but systemic, right? <laughs> yeah. So they say these symptoms experienced during mild COVID. Now, now, these are all people that had mild infections, right? Thank goodness May you challenged them, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> may be more closely associated with immunological responses than viral load. Mm -hmm. So let's not blame the virus, folks. Blame uh, ourselves. <laughs> no, it's always the immune response's fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right, right. It's TLRs, recognizing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right, so those are the soluble. And we'll make a conclusion in a, in a moment. Then they look at T cell responses. They look at CD4 and CD8 T cells. They look at different kinds of T cells with different markers, but basically um, they, they peak either at 10 days or 7 to 14 days, depending on what you're looking for. So they're activated over a longer period of time. And then they also look at antigen-specific T cells that, uh, that respond to a particular uh, peptide, and they can see those uh, going up by 10 days after infection. These, of course, are from serum, right? not from the, the nasal carity. So to play devil's advocate, I mean, this is yeah. cool that we know this, but right. is this anything new? Because we've been saying since I started studying immunology that it takes about seven days. No, I don't think the timing is new, no. I think yeah. the difference in the compartments, at yeah, least I for think me. That is, that is mm -hmm. cool, right? yeah. I didn't know that. It's just not, na nose and throat and serum, they're different, yeah. right? Which could be different for a different respiratory pathogen. Of course, Try absolutely, up. yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is SARS-CoV-2, right. right? Let's do it for influenza, yeah. 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 Or what about Our, something that has viremia? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good point. What's a so respiratory what are, pathogen that has viremia? RSV? Does I don't. Does no, it, I mean, it depends what you mean by a respiratory. If if you cause disease in the respiratory tract, I don't know. Measles enters, but. Measles. Yeah. Is there a respiratory um, syndrome associated with measles? I don't remember. Of course, you can get can measles pneumonia. So, yeah, yeah I think yeah. you can call that. Okay. So, But uh, I don't think you want to challenge people with measles. No. 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 Especially seronegative people because uh, you get all kinds of issues, right? Right. Uh, then they measured antibodies, nasal and plasma antibodies, IgG, IgA, and IgM for spike protein. These appear both nasally and systemically at about 10 days 
after inoculation. Um, IgG and IgA uh, still are increasing on day 28, but the nose plateaus earlier, 14 to 28 days. And that's not surprising, right? Mm -hmm. the, the nose is uh, is weaker. <laughs> Um, so the so there's also a disconnect here. The local antibody response is induced more rapidly uh, than antibodies in the circulation, and but that you might expect, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So then they say, what is the what correlates with viral suppression, right? What are the potential drivers? Um, so they find first of all the earlier onset of viral load and a more rapid reproduction rate correlate with early interferon activation in peak time, which makes sense because that's the virus that's driving right, right. Mm -hmm. the interferon. Same thing with IL-29, the, the growth rate of the virus and the induction of nasal IL-29. However, no significant relationship between the magnitude of nasal interferons and viral load decay rates. Mm -hmm. Which isn't, I, I, you know, in other studies, um, I think they had drawn correlations between those two. So that's interesting. Well, they may, see, that's the problem. Those are observational, right? And so yeah, right. there could be confounding factors, but sure. I don't know. I just don't know. So they say the viral load drives the interferon response, but the higher response is not associated with clearance. Huh. Uh, what it is associated with is the D cell response. <laughs> So the the CD8 in particular, not CD4, but CD8 T cell response is associated with uh, uh, viral clearance. Um, they they also find uh, some association with antibody uh, levels and viral clearance. But if you look at, they have a nice summary figure uh, at the end where you can look at viral load, you can look at interferon, CD4, CD8, and antibodies. And you know the the viral load is going down before the antibodies start to to rise. So go CD8 T cells go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story here. That interferon. I don't. It's hard to know if you take out interferon or if you have antibodies to interferon, you get severe COVID. Yeah. So obviously mm -hmm. they're doing something. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. It's interesting. <laughs> But it's the CD8 T cells and also the mucosal IgM and IgA that um, they think contribute to the end of uh, infection. So, in fact, in their, their conclusion, they say that um, a robust CD8 T cell response is therefore a major effector mechanism in self-limiting mild infection, right? We don't know about severe because these are all mild. And so vaccines to generate T cells uh, should be prioritized. Well, yeah. We don't love so, those. I mean, it makes you wonder, <laughs> at least for mild disease, you know, every time you have a, a variant that evades antibody, what difference does it make as long as the T cell response is conserved, right? Right, right. But it's hard to it, generate the T cell responses with the vaccines. We get some. Yeah, you level only get spikes. With, the, yeah. you know, with yeah. the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, which him showed us in the very first right. snippet that we did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, the nucleic acid vaccines maybe are doing a little bit better with T cell responses than some other vaccine types. Yeah. Um, but clearly, we need to do more work to think about uh, CD8 T cell. So yeah. Their last response. sentence is uh, CD8 T cells likely effectors of viral clearance to limit both disease and transmission. I think that's important for people to. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could be that, and Paul Offit always says this. He says, in a very in an older person with a lot of comorbidities, any kind of infection makes them very sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have some immune evasion, antibody level, and they get infected, that's that's it. They're they're trash. Whereas a young person will get mild disease, uh, but his his or her T cells will be protective, right? So. Right. Anyway, it's it's so uh, this is nice that they did a lot of very detailed work on those, yeah. uh, those. I mean, I thought this was kind of an unethical experiment because, you know, you can say we use, uh, what is it, uh, how old, 18 to 29-year-old healthy adults, but how do you know they're really healthy, right? They may have some things you don't know about, and maybe they get long COVID or, or severe. Right. I mean, 
what's the statistic now on how many people get long COVID, even if they're relatively healthy? It's like one in 20 or something. Is that, is that hard really to do high. now in a seropositive population? Yeah, right? I think well, it's hard to do because really there's sort of the unvaccinated versus vaccinated and all of those so From what Daniel has said the last few weeks, it's like it's around 1%, but those are hard studies. Mm. You know, okay. A lot of them are 1%. self-reported yeah. and you just don't know. But, uh, you know. So, yeah, I think they um, would need to do things like screen them for anti-interferon antibodies. That's right. As mm -hmm. one potential. Mm -hmm. But I think one of these individuals lost sense of smell and taste for some time and they were trying to, I mean, that's, what if you lost your smell and taste forever, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that would, so that's why I think it's I mean, it's interesting, right? Because in, influenza um, is, a, is they, they infect people with, with flu to test vaccines. Um, yes, that's and, right. And yep. flu has, in a rare percentage of people, um, can have some other, you know, neurological issues. It's, it's rare. So I, I, that could also fall in this same kind of ethical dilemma. I know. It's a hard thing because you don't make progress unless you take risks, right? Yeah. And I suppose these people signed up, so they they read whatever was given to them, and they decided they were okay with it, right? Right. So, I mean, ethics is only goes so far as how they agree. If they say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing that you do an unethical experiment on me, uh, <laughs> it's only when you don't want it done that it becomes... I, I just don't know. Yeah. I thought it was. But you're right. They do it with flu. They do it with rhinovirus and right. so forth, so. But I, I think what we learned from this is good. I, I mean, there are many things you'd like to do in a challenge experiment. Um, I, I think would be imp so. So you know, now you can work with SARS-CoV-2 at BSL-2. The WHO has just declared that you can do BSL-2. So now I hope people do plaque assays and measure how much virus is actually present right. in the nasal wash, not right. just culture positive, right? But quantify it. Right. How do you? So how do you think that? Is that going to trickle down? I mean, have you guys heard about SARS-CoV-2 being a BSL-2 pathogen at our universities? No. Not yet. Uh, right, this okay. document just came out like last week. Right. Right, a reporter Do you anticipate, sent it to me. So for it to be a BSL-2 pathogen at the university level, the NIH has to decide with the CDC yeah, yeah, that sure. we can do that. Do you, I mean, just prediction, do you think that's going to happen? Usually the CDC follows WHO, Interesting. right? So yeah. um, I suspect so. We'll mm -hmm. see. I mean, I'm on the IBC on, at Columbia. I'm going to bring this up yeah. next time. Yeah. I'm interested to know uh, what they need. Because I think it's good to have it be a cell too. I mean, look, virus is everywhere, right? It's not I like know. the beginning of the pandemic where it was only in labs mostly. So I re Yeah, I remember <laughs> working with it a, a year or two ago and my son had it. And so I'm gowning up to go into a biosafety hood to work yeah. with this virus. And my kid is just snotting yeah. all over me. Yeah, home. it's kind so, of weird, right? Yeah, it's weird. Totally. You're more at risk at home than in... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that is uh, 78. Tell us if you like that kind of format. That was fun. Uh, you can send your comments, questions to immune at microbe.tv. And if you like uh, our programs and, and any of the other ones at Microbe TV, we'd love your financial support. We're a nonprofit company, so your deduct your uh, donations would be U.S. federal tax deductible. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer can be found at Cornell University should you wander upstate New York. Or uh, Cindy Leifer on Twitter or X. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> Steph Langle is at Case Western Reserve University. Stephanie Langle on the social media. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on X. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. I learned a lot. I am Vincent Racaniello. I'm at microbe.tv. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. Mm -hmm.